All right, let's do it. Fantastic. Well, thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, today's webinar is hosted by Zoe Financial. And here a brief disclosure, this presentation is not to be taken as investment advice and should, be not, should not be relied on for such advice or as a substitute for consultation with professional accounting, tax, legal, or financial advisors. The observations made are independent of Zoe Financial and should not be read as financial recommendations. Today's webinar is on working with an independent advisor versus a big bank. We'll be covering the pros and the cons on both sides. And then today's host is, of course, our CEO and founder, Andres Garcia Maya. A quick snippet on Andres. Prior to founding Zoe Financial, Andres was an executive director at JP Morgan Asset Management, where he helped oversee over $300 billion in assets. He is a CFA charter holder and obtained an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. There, he received both the Joseph Wharton Fellowship for Outstanding Record of Academic Achievement, as well as the Troigo Foundation Fellowship. With you, Andres. Thank you, uh, uh, Alexandra, and thanks so much for putting the webinar uh, together. We definitely would not be able to, to do these webinars without uh, Alexandra's help. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, just before we get started on the webinar, uh, I figure for people that might be new to Zoe, it would be good for, to take a second and just kind of give you a sense of who we are and what we stand for. So our mission is to empower Americans to make better financial decisions, starting with whom they hire as a financial advisor. Right, so we are a marketplace where one side, people that are looking for a financial advisor uh, could use our services to get matched up with their ideal advisor. And on the other side of the marketplace, we have a heavily vetted network of independent uh, financial advisors. And these webinars are possible because we have the best of the best advisors in the network, as you'll, as you'll learn in a minute. Uh, and for that reason, we have kind of uh, great experts in different areas that, that we could bring along and, and, and empower people when it comes to uh, how to make better financial decisions. So the panelists for today, uh, and I'll go through each one of, of you. So Frederick uh, Stanfield, uh, Stacy, and Stacy, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. So uh, actually, can you, say, can you say it ahead of me before I kill it? Oh, sure. No problem. It's French. It's Chrétien. Oh. That, you, I'm glad that I let you say it because it's like a French, you said it in like a French kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and Colin Oberweg. So let me give you a little bit of uh, background on each of our panelists. So, uh, so Frederick is the founder of Life Water Wealth Management. He, uh, I mean, uh, the fun part for me is that everyone that's on the network uh, eventually at the end of the process, I get to interview. And so every time I'm kind of going through this, I'm like, oh, Frederick's the man. Like each, each ad advisor that goes through it, I'm like, oh, he's so good. So uh, he's the founder of Lightwater uh, uh, Wealth Management. Since 2000, he's worked with clients regarding personal wealth and investment matters. Uh, he's a licensed CPA in the state of Georgia and Alabama. He's also a certified financial planner and FINRA Series 65 uh, license. Uh, he has over 10 years of experience as a financial advisor, uh, but I, I think what's just most um, kind of, you know, having, having uh, gotten to know him over time, I think is just his, uh, his calm demeanor towards solving big problems and, and understanding and, and being a great listener. Uh, it's, it's just so, you feel like calm after talking to Frederick. <laughs> so, um, so, so he has this calming uh, kind of aura to him. So all these great accomplishments and great career are great, but I think that's personally one of the things that I'm like, that's a great quality you have as a financial advisor as well, is to have that kind of calming demeanor. So welcome, uh, Frederick. Thank you. Uh, then we have Stacy. Stacy's uh, Capasso, Plan uh, Capasso Planning Partner. She's a partner there. Uh, she offers comprehensive uh, fiduciary uh, fee-only financial advice, and she specializes in helping clients navigate through life's many financial transitions. She has over 30 years of financial service uh, experience, spending six, six years at Deloitte, practicing, practicing as a certified public accountant, so another uh, CPA with 10 years as a, as a strategic analyst and 14 years as a financial advisor. So as you can tell, these are reason that uh, these folks are in the network. They are so well-rounded in the sense of 
the level of expertise they have in different um, areas. So welcome, Stacy. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Colin Overweg. Uh, he's the founder of Advice Wealth uh, Management. As you can see by his flowing blonde hair, he's uh, he's out in the West Coast, as uh, as exactly as you would as you would as you would envision it. Uh, and I gotta say, Colin also from the perspective of like um, an aura, he has this very calming demeanor, almost like you know very West Coast, but but West Coast not in the L.A. Uh, frenzy, but more of the LA surfing type type of wave, um, which I really enjoy talking to him from that perspective. He has uh, over five years of navigating clunky technology and strict marketing compliance. Colin left the broker dealer world to start his own practice. Uh, so I think it's very applicable, obviously, for this conversation. He's obviously also a CFP uh, and just an amazing financial planner. I think he's, uh, you know, uh, Colin has been in the network now for, I want to say, over two years, right, Colin? It has, yeah. Th this and, summer is two years. Yeah, so from that perspective, we've, we've seen him, you know, uh, on board a number of clients through the Zoe Network. And the feedback is always just how practical he is, how great of a listener he is. And, and you know, those are all qualities that don't just jump at you as a CFP, but are so important uh, to have as a financial advisor. So really happy to, to have you uh, as a panelist. And why don't we just dive right in, right? So what, um, what we're going to cover is the pros and cons of brokers versus advisors. And when we mean brokers, we'll talk a little bit about this, but essentially large uh, broker dealers and banks um, that service clients versus uh, financial advisors and specifically independent financial advisors. So what are the pros and cons of hiring uh, one versus the other? And we'll, we'll use kind of three different frameworks. One is fees, the other one's products, and then the technology. And lastly, uh, I would love to get each of, uh, of our panelists to just kind of describe why they're uh, a, a registered independent advisor, why they went the independent route. Uh, because ultimately what we've learned about you know, um, running Zoe now for a couple of years is, you know, each each partner, each advisor has a great story as to why they went about it this route. And it's really important uh, for people to understand why is it that that people go on and become an independent advisor. So we'll kind of end it on, on that note. So just to give you a sense of um, a starting line to the conversation, <clears throat> there is different ways in which advisors could get paid for their services. Um, and the reality of it is there is not such thing as no conflict of interest, right? If you're getting paid for a service, there is some type of conflict, right? Because you're not doing it for free, but there are different, call it dimensions or, or kind of, there are some ways in which advisors get paid that have more conflicts than others, right? So the least aligned um, uh, way of getting paid for an advisor is when they're commission-based. Right. So if you look at this page, you're essentially going from left to right. Left is the most, or I should say, the least aligned with clients incentives. The more on the right, the more that aligned they are with clients and therefore less uh, conflict of interest. So commission base was kind of the way in which business was done for decades. And essentially, clients would either pay uh, per transaction, meaning, you know, if, uh, if they're buying a stock, uh, or a bond, the advisor would get paid a commission every time they bought and sold shares. And as you can imagine, it's a lot of conflicts with that because then advisors would be kind of incentivized to make you buy and sell more stuff. Uh, but there's also other ways in which advisors could get paid from a commission standpoint by recommending certain products. So think of it as almost like as a pharma sales rep selling a particular product. The more products they sell, the more the pharmaceutical company is going to pay them, right? So that's the commission-based approach. The fee-based approach is essentially, I don't know, you have a million dollars, the advisor is going to uh, charge 1% and make $10,000, but fee-based could also include other types of compensation from the products that they recommend. So it's not kind of purely the client paying. And then the last, uh, all the way to the right is fee-only advice, which is, best way of thinking about it is the only person paying the advisor is the client, right? So clients are paying for the advice and the advisor doesn't have any other form of compensation from you know, either products or a broker dealer or whatever it may be. Uh, so those are kind of the spectrum. 
And all, all three of the panelists are on the right side of this, right? They're fee-only advisors, they're independent, they have open architecture of all the products that they recommend that they don't get any kickbacks, if you will, for recommending any products. Having said that, you know, we often get this question like, well, there's gotta be a reason that people do hire an advisor at a bank, right? So we wanted to provide some transparency of the pros and cons on both sides. And hopefully that helps people make a decision, um, you know, as to why they would go with one or the other, or even if they choose the bank, at least they understand where the conflict of interest are. And from that perspective, hopefully they can make better decisions while, while they're working with someone in the bank. So um, at the big bank, and we call it a big bank, but just so we don't want to name names, but think just of the big, you know, national uh, banks, uh, as well as maybe the ones that are not even banks, but are broker dealers, right? So I don't know, the Ameriprises of the world, the LPLs of the world, Edward Jones, these all kind of fit into that same category, even if, if you incorporate them into the, the bigger national brand names. Um, and that, so I'll take a minute here to go through some of the, uh, the pros and the cons, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, allow some of the panelists also to, to chime in uh, and I'll kind of call it, call on you guys, uh, but I'll start with the some of the obvious pros, right? So the obvious pros of going with um, you know um, a Fidelity or a Merrill Lynch or a Schwab is that they have brand recognition, right? Like you've seen the commercials, you trust the brand, and you're talking about money, right? So you're like, that's why maybe I would go there. I don't have to think about it, and from the perspective of like I know those names. Um, another pro is is a one-stop shop, right? If you go to a Merrill Lynch, uh, you could have um, this, you know, you could have service on the advice side, on the investment side, on the mortgage, on, on a checking account. So you can kind of do it all in one place. And that I would say is a big, is a big pro uh, for, for uh, clients that, you know, that are at a bank. And the last one here is preferred lending ability. Uh, you know, um, I have a mortgage and uh, at Merrill Lynch, they uh, you know there's not a lot of banks, large banks that offer um, good rates for mortgages, so that's a plus for them, right? Like it's not like um, you know an independent advisor could you know could offer you a mortgage. So the preferred lending avail uh, availability is definitely a huge pro. Uh, and then some of the cons, and um, maybe I'll, I'll I'll pull in Colin here, considering you have some experience working at large institutions where you know it is one-stop shop and it offers some of these pros maybe to chime in and, and and share some of the some of the cons especially maybe on the conflict of interest one which i think are the ones that you're more familiar having been kind of on the other side of the uh, on the other side of the fence absolutely well thanks for having us andreas uh i mean just very fundamentally if you make and manufacture a product what do you think you're going to be recommending and, and that really just kind of uh, spoke true to the, the two experiences that I had with big broker dealers. And they always just kind of had a sneaky way of doing it. You know, it's like, we're independent. We could use any products. And sometimes they'll even hire third party uh, advisors to, you know, create the, the mutual fund portfolios or the ETF portfolios. And somehow those mutual funds or ETFs just kept sneaking their way into the, the portfolio in a very heavy, heavy way. And also there might be maybe some incentives for the advisor if you uh, are able to get more assets into this product or this type of platform, you get to go on a trip or you get this or you get a higher payout. That's a common one. So there's always just kind of these little areas that kind of uh, chip away to make it uh, less independent, even though uh, a lot of our, our independent broker dealer friends will tell us that they have access to all products and that they're not uh, held captive in any way. Uh, of course, the furthest to your left in that last slide is kind of more of a captive agent where maybe they, exactly, maybe they only have one product. You go to an insurance agent and they only have one product and well, you know, you're a hammer if and every solution or if the, the problem's a nail, every solution's the hammer. So um, that's kind of the first thing that really stuck out to me and, uh, and really pushed me towards the RIA space. Yeah. And then the one thing also that, uh, that I would add is that often when you deal with larger organizations, that obviously the upside is that one-stop shop. The downside is that it's very impersonal, right? So you're, you're left kind of calling a number, 
every time you talk to someone, they don't know who you are. You have to start from scratch. You know, 20 minutes in, they transfer you somebody else. And so from that perspective, that's that's the con. And everyone that's listening to this kind of knows that knows those cons are, are already. But I think they might not be as aware uh, of the ones that, you know, that, that Colin described. Having said that, again, the, the, the ones on the left should not be understated, right? The, especially the lending one, right? Uh, and often independent advisors will help the client if they have a mortgage at Merrill or, or other places still uh, and kind of walk them through the process. But nonetheless, you still kind of have to deal with the banks for that. So often people say, oh, my, might as well then, what the heck, I'll do everything there, right? So that's the pro is that you can have like that one-stop shop. Um, let's switch gears to the, to the RIA pros and, and, and cons. And, and for that, I, I'll definitely kind of uh, allow our, our panelists to, to have kind of a more open discussion instead of me kind of go through each one of them. So uh, Frederick, I, I would love to um, spend maybe a minute just kind of describing some of the pros uh, of, of being an RIA. I could chime in and say some of the cons, but the cons are almost kind of the opposite of what we just talked about on the prior slide, but maybe we'll start with you there. Oh, thank you, Andreas. And, and I'm gonna just pick up on something you said a little bit earlier. I think sometimes at large institutions, it can become your part of the process versus, versus things being more personalized. And that's the thing that I yeah. love about and why I became an R RIA is because it's personalized advice where you get to listen and understand what each and every client is facing that's unique to them so that you can craft solutions and it becomes more about the people and their story and their dreams than it is just about yep. getting into the process to get to the next client. And, and I think the other thing that the other pro that I really love here is being a true fiduciary. Uh, I love being independent because being fee only, the only person that pays me, as you said earlier, is the client themselves. And when you have that freedom that the client is who you answer to ultimately, you're truly free to serve the best interests of the client and you don't have to worry about the interests of some other institution. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And uh, Stacey, uh, I'd love for you to chime in as well and kind of share some of the, some of the pros there as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, participate. Uh, I would echo what I'm hearing from my two colleagues here in that, um, you know, Oftentimes, you know, people come to us because they are in a transition. They need guidance, and you know, there's a level of vulnerability in that. You know, they need help, and they're looking for uh, advice that can help them make key decisions in their in their life. And you know, oftentimes, you know, just it's important to make sure that one competency is there and. You know, Zoe does a fantastic job in identifying professionals that have that competency there, but it's also, you know, the personality. Do I really connect with this person? Do I feel comfortable letting them know about things that I feel insecure about? Um, you know, do I feel comfortable that they're going to give me um, unbiased guidance? So uh, being an independent allows me to customize the relationships that I have. With my clients, I can spend as much time as I like getting to know them better. I'm not limited by guidelines in terms of how many um, you know products I need to present, how many you know widgets I need to sell, and um, I have a lot of more flexibility in the way that I do the work with them. So there's just so much more um, richness in the relationship and being an independent advisor. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And, and something also to keep in mind, looking at the the cons uh, column is, and I've learned this over time, is that it really also depends what you're looking for as a client when it comes to, uh, for instance, let's say that you're somebody that really wants uh, access to, I don't know, um, private equity products or uh, venture capital um, and call it like super illiquid um, products where you're just kind of trying to beat the market or you're trying to to find ways in efficiency in the market and, and getting access to them, you know, for 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 that, um, the banks or the larger broker dealers might have more access to those what's called alternative investments, right? Um, you know, and, and specifically, I'm thinking of like private equity or hedge fund exposure. Um, so if that's something that's really interesting as a, as an investor or something that you're looking for, and in, in our experience, 
is usually not like a perfect match for an independent advisor, right? Um, and, and, and that's something to keep in mind, right? If like, that's what they're looking for. Sure, there are some independent advisor practices that are you know, large enough that could give you access, but that's usually not their value proposition to begin with, right? Like that's not what they're saying, hey, this is what you come to us for versus at a larger bank, uh, that is something that they sell as their value pro proposition, right? So something to keep in mind as you're trying to figure out what is it that you're looking for, what you what you need. If that's what kind of you need or you're looking for, you know, the, uh, frankly, the banks are better for that access to those type of, uh, of products uh, versus uh, an independent uh, uh, financial advisor. And then we talked about the other ones, right? Lending, banking, and the less support staff. Uh, maybe the way that I would describe it is that they, they, they tend to have much larger teams, you know, especially the, the banks might have representation in all time zones, et cetera. And that's something to, all, for sure to be considered. It also goes along the lines of what I was saying earlier, which is they might not know who you are. And you're kind of calling a 1-800 number. But nonetheless, that is something that is there. And if that's something that's key as you're looking to hire someone, that's something obviously you have to take into consideration when you're figuring out between the, between the two options. Is there anything else that, uh, that you guys want to add here? Anything that you want, you would like to chime in, Colin, maybe on this one? Probably my favorite example uh, for the pros, uh, trying not to be completely biased here, on the, the big bank side, I, I made the example when we were chatting last time of like Jeff Bezos and having a loan against his large portfolio of oh, right. Am yeah. Amazon stock. Like basically the guy can refinance like we would on a home with his stock, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to take on Jeff if you're listening uh, as a client, <laughs> but I, you know, I don't have the capital to go ahead and give you 4 billion bucks and just hang on to the stock and then be able to lend it and have that on my balance sheet yep. just to be able to meet some, some uh, regulation requirements. So, you know, that's maybe an example where like, you know, these deca millionaires are, are able to leverage some uh, yep. new products, or if you wanted to, let's say short the housing market, you're not going to be able to create some type <laughs> of product you know, at, at a, a, maybe a smaller RIA like you would uh, with a big bank. So that's probably the, the examples. Yeah, I'd make well, that's, a, that's a great example. And we've seen that um, uh, one thing that I'll throw in the caveat of um, basically borrowing from your own investments to, to, to leverage up to buy more. Because mm -hmm. um, we've seen a couple of banks do that and often actually win with that, especially for like five people that have $5 million, $10 million and, and more. And something to keep in mind with that, that often, especially people that haven't done it before, is that if you decide that the service wasn't good, you, you kind of can leave, <laughs> right? Um, all of a sudden they'll say, well, you need to now give us collateral. Uh, uh, you know, your positions are not doing as well as you thought, and now you owe us 500 grand. So if you want to leave, you're going to have to actually, so there are like anything else, they ain't, there's no free lunch, <laughs> right? So just be careful with those type of approaches, especially if you are not as familiar with using leverage when investing. Because right. we've mm -hmm. seen a couple of investors that were choosing between an independent advisor when with a large bank because they got that offered. And then specifically in March, April of last year, a number then came, came back to the network to try to hire an independent advisor because they didn't know what to do. Now they're down you know, 30% of the portfolio and they had leverage of, you know, 2X of their investment. And now they, you know, they had a million, but now they owe a million and a half, right? It's like, um, so, so you just got to be careful with, with leverage, but also there, there's no free lunch, right? So if they're offering something that sounds really enticing. You just need to truly understand what happens if things don't work out. And, um, you know, and we've seen, unfortunately, last year, we kind of saw that firsthand um, here, in, here in the network. Okay, so the one other thing that I wanted to cover here, uh, I'm sorry, well, uh, before we move on to technology is fees, because often there's kind of, um, um, this, this comes up a lot with, with clients. Uh, clients don't think about the, the full cost of hiring somebody. And what I mean by that is, it's not only that you're paying, let's say an advisor 1%, if, um, if, the, if they're buying products that cost another half a percent, right? Your total cost is actually one and a half percent, right? So you got to look at it at the full cost of, of paying for that advisor. 
And there's actually been, uh, there, there's, there've been studies on this, right? Um, and actually just by, you know, basically studies looking at the SEC public records, right? So all this stuff is actually public, but there's been studies that aggregate all this information. And uh, one study in particular found that when you look at independent RIAs, uh, just the just the advisory fees, forget about the investment fees, which tend to be much more expensive than this. Um, for clients that have uh, under uh, uh, under $100,000, the fee for independent RAs is 1.15. For clients that have over 1 million, the fee is 1%, essentially, versus it, uh, at a, call it, broker dealer or a bank combined on aggregate, they're roughly, if for the over a million is roughly 40% more expensive for, uh, for the smaller accounts uh, often is twice as expensive uh, to, uh, to go to the banks, right? And um, for a lot of people that might be very surprising, but the reality is that you often don't even know what you're paying. Like there's like 800 pages of small font and, you know, I, I specifically, I worked at a bank. It's something that's like almost trained to not talk about like what the actual fee is, right? So from that perspective, the client's kind of like, so this is free? And they're like, well, no, it's not free, but like, this is what you get. And, and they're kind of like, okay. And then they sign up and we see this all the time. It's actually pretty sad how often when a client hires an advisor through the network, they bring the statements to the advisor and this is the first time they actually realized how much they were paying, right? Uh, we, we hear sometimes people come in and say, no, 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 but they were doing this for free. And, you, and you're kind of like, no, they weren't. Let's look at the fees. And it's like, no, they were, you were paying 2% of fees, right? So you're, you know, you're paying 20 grand out of a million in, in fees. Um, That's so, my favorite one is I don't pay my advisor or anything. Or Yeah, no, it's crazy. I mean, I, I, this is like, it sounds crazy to say, but we hear this uh, a fair amount of time, especially from the insurance business, where they'll say, no, 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 he's just helping me out because we're a, a yeah. potentially good client down the road. And then often what happens is they sold an annuity and that's how the advisor got paid. Uh, so this is, the, this is the chart, let's put it this way. This is the chart that kind of, um, I knew implicitly having worked in a bank and, and left, but when we found the data, we're like, and that's why we exist, right? Because it's just like such an obvious opportunity to present clients to advisors that are 40 to 100% cheaper that offer better service than, <laughs> than in many cases what they, what they would get on the other side. So if anyone has specific um, questions on this particular chart, we actually wrote a white paper just on this topic. So just hit us up either in the chat room or you know, at the end, I'll I'll provide some email um, information for 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 people that want to reach out. Uh, you know, we're big geeks about this, so if anyone really wants to go deep on this, well, we're we're happy to <laughs> we're we're happy to to share the the material. Uh, but any any uh, anyone wants to chime in on this? I mean, you guys have seen this chart before through what we have in Zoe, but I don't know if anyone else has any kind of anything else to add. Yeah, I, I would echo what Colin is saying in that oftentimes, you know, people aren't clear what they're paying. And, you know, the thing I often hear is that people, you know, are sold these relationships. They're not necessarily going out and buying them. If you're a purchaser in the market, you're going to be much more clear on what you're buying. But um, you go into an office and someone sits you down and then tells you all these wonderful, great things. It's difficult sometimes to understand all that information that's coming towards you. So my advice, regardless of who you work with, it's always important to ask the question, you know, what's your motivation? How are you getting paid? And show with me detail on what I'm getting paid. And, you know, when I think about the inexperience on some of the people in the broker dealers is they themselves aren't clear. They themselves don't know yeah. what they're doing. So that's part of the challenge there. That, that's the crazy part uh, I've learned because a lot of these are, let's put it this way, they're good people, right? Like, they, they came out of school, they went to work at large bank, they were trained. And often when we interview people that uh, advisors that could potentially join the network, it's amazing how often they didn't actually knew, they, they actually didn't know, <laughs> like they didn't yeah. know uh, themselves, right? And they're like, no, no, but like, you know, 
the annuity is actually not that expensive. And we would break it down and there, you could see kind of the world crashing <laughs> like before their eyes. So, um, so yeah, that's the crazy part. And again, it's not like, uh, I, I'm a big believer. There's not like bad people or good people is, is incentives, right? Like where the incentives right. are, you know, if you have a family, if you're trying to support your family and they say, this is how you could support that family, guess what eventually where you go, you're going to do. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, so, so, you know, we're big believers on understand people's incentives and, and you'll find out long-term how that relationship is going to, <laughs> how that relationship is going to pan out. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, this is an important slide here on, on, on services because the, and this is, I, I would put it this way, not necessarily of, um, just kind of brokers versus RIAs, but, it, but more around when you interview an advisor, trying to really understand what is the service that they provide, right? Um, we talked a little bit about earlier that the banks might have access to alternatives, et cetera. Uh, so if that's what they're kind of con continuously telling you that that's the value, you know, often you can't do it all, right? So it's like, if that's what you're going to do, are you also going to be able to provide comprehensive financial planning? Are you also going to be able to understand my whole financial life? And those are the type of questions that you really want to uh, get to. Uh, and often I know, you know, from, from uh, experience, even with family members, you, they often don't know what they're looking for, right? They know they have a problem, but they don't really know what the solution is. So the best way is just to read and kind of educate yourself on what those services are. Uh, and ask a lot of questions, right? So in this particular case, um, the services that independent advisors, maybe this is the best way I would describe it, is because you're because the client is the only one paying them, going back to incentives, they have nothing else to sell but <laughs> provide advice. And from that perspective, we do tend to see people that have more designations, that have the right background to provide advice, because guess what? Like, if that's the only way you get paid, uh, you you better be able to provide <laughs> to provide advice. Um, and uh, so that's been my my experience. But I would love to hear uh, you know Frederick from from your experience in the sense of if you also see a difference in the sense of like maybe what independent advisors offer versus what somebody at a bank would. Yeah, that's a great point, and and, and I kind of hearken on both the words service and product. And, and I look at service as as an independent advisor, we're going through the process of serving you, understanding your uh, goals, understanding what you're trying to accomplish. Whereas with products is usually correlated to, I built something, manufactured something, designed something, so I have a product to sell. And so serving yeah. is about, hey, what's the goal slash solution? It's kind of goal and solution driven. And when you're doing that, you're looking at it as an advisor more holistically, a, a, a CFP. We're looking at the holistic, the whole you. We're not just looking for a product to meet an investment need because often, um, sometimes I feel consumers go in and they go into these situations and they're given a product to meet just a need versus someone understanding their entire holistic financial plan and delivering a service. And, and, and I think that's the real value of working with more of the IRA uh, sort of segment of this uh, financial services universe. Stacy, you wanna, you have, you have something else to yeah, share? Yeah, no, I'd love to add in on that. I agree with what Frederick is saying wholeheartedly. You know, I found myself, um, you know, I find joy in helping people. And when I would ask the question, how could I help? Uh, I found myself more and more tied to, you know, a box of, products that, you know, I would look to see which one of these might be able to fit that need. And if there wasn't something that fit their need from a compensation standpoint, you know, my motivation was to say, well, what else, what else? And kind of <laughs> shelving, you know, what they had versus now uh, in this role, I've got a lot more flexibility in that um, I'm able to truly listen, what is the need, um, identify a solution and, you know, honestly, I don't have a conflict of interest in that, you know, if they want to get the um, ultimate, you know, solution someplace else, I can direct them to it, but they're paying me for my time, my expertise, my intellect, not, not for a product or services. So I'm just much more free in the way I can help people. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And then the last kind of dimension is, is technology. And I could speak to this, uh, 
you know, personally having worked at two banks prior to starting Zoe, that um, it's not that they're not trying to improve the technologies, that is that their technology was built in the 1970s and 1980s, right? So it's just very hard to uh, basically say, okay, scratch everything that we build the house on, like the foundation of the house to build a new foundation is really difficult to do. Um, and so from that perspective, independent advisors just have like, a, you know, embedded advantage, which is, uh, it's kind of like, you know, if you see houses that were, you know, that were built in the, in the 80s versus now, it's like there's certain materials that now exist and there's better things that you could do with a house to, for the wind and for the erosion. And, and so from that perspective, independent advisors just tend to have better uh, of a technology stack because they, when they started their practice, there was just, there was better, you know, better technology out. Um, and that was one of the reasons that we saw as an opportunity when we started Zoe to partner with independent advisors, frankly, is because all the things we discussed, but also that they tended to be much more digitally native, <laughs> if you will, than yes. the larger, uh, the larger institutions. And, um, you know, obviously one of the things that, that we are constantly working on at Zoe is to even enhance what the independent advisors have when it comes to that digital journey, uh, but I know Colin, you you had you had some um, some comments around this as well when it comes to like the paperwork and, and all. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, it's like you said though. I mean, what would you rather do? I, why compete against these companies that focus one hundred percent on digital storage or one hundred percent on creating a Zoom call or or a conference space or just there's companies out there that are competing against each other for one specific niche. And uh, the broker dealer that I was working with, both of them really had kind of their own one-off solution. So if you wanted to have an e-signature, they had their own uh, piece of technology to try and attempt to do it is, is what I like to say. Um, and I just got so fed up with it. I, I was calling you know my compliance officer and saying, look, this individual is in Florida and I need them. I was in Michigan at the time to sign this document and the tech, the, the signature just would not go through. They had to click a box and we did, we messed up like three or four times. I felt awful for this individual client. And I was joking that I was going to ride down there on my horse and have them sign this thing with a feather <laughs> pen. Um, and, and that might've been a, about a month before I left. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is it, it it is crazy, and I and I and I think there's a long way to go, in general, for the technology in the industry to be where clients want it to be, meaning like where other parts of their lives they're so accustomed to everything being digital. But um, but I do think that in, in the independent channel, there's just a lot more early adoption, and and I'll definitely single out Colin here, where you're constantly kind of testing new products and testing new ways to to make um, clients life easier from a digital standpoint. And that's that's how you innovate, right? That's how you can constantly try to like make the experience better. Um, and that's something that we really kind of hone in is getting the feedback from the client. Uh, because one thing that, that I've learned having worked in the industry for a long time is that, you know, a lot of times the expert in this case, uh, the advisor um, is often trying to figure out also how could they kind of scale their business and what technology allows them to do that versus uh, of thinking, well, if I am one client, how is that, is that experience going to, to be for me? Um, and that's really where one of the things that we, you know, we look for when we um, interview advisors is, are they thinking about it from the client's perspective or are they thinking about it from what makes their life easier, <laughs> right? And it's amazing how often the advice is like, oh, we have amazing technology. And then they go through it. And I'm like, all of those help you. <laughs> like, all of those tools help you. Uh, which ones are the ones that help the client? And they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know? so, um, so that's one thing also that, that I would say that, that uh, at Zoe, we, we look for is advisors that are trying to add technology that make the client's life easier, not just their life easier. And one thing to add there, Andreas, if you go to a FinTech conference, you're not going to see anyone from the big box banks because they couldn't implement it anyway. Hey, they the broker, wanted to. <laughs> the broker dealers tell you what you can and can't use where I'm going there. And like you said, I'm playing with all the technology. I'm having a blast. 
And yeah. next thing you know, I have an outsourced CPA firm that I'm working really close with and an outsourced estate attorney. And I'm not a CPA or an attorney, nor do I want to be. But yeah. we have the solutions built in with a digital platform and being able to, to maybe yeah. even meet with an attorney or a CPA on the back end. Yeah, for sure. And that's often something that when we get new prospective clients, they ask is, especially if they're, you know, um, in their 30s or in their 40s, they'll say like, well, I, you know, please put me in somebody in front of, especially by the way, in California, it's like, please put me in front of somebody that that's going to be able to do everything digitally, right? Because they're so fed up with their experiences at the, you know, at the larger uh, institution. So this is obviously an area that we're really excited because uh, I think we're just going to keep kind of pushing and innovative to make the client's life easier. Um, okay, so, and I'm going to stop sharing kind of the slide here just so that we could focus on, on the person, but I would love to, um, you know, go kind of one by one and just kind of hear the story, um, you know, of, of Frederick, uh, Stacy, and Colin on kind of the rationale for, for becoming uh, independent. So I'll start, I'll start with Frederick, but I'll stop sharing here for a second, just so that, you know, we could actually, if not, I don't know if you guys noticed, like, you know, when you're sharing the screen, we're kind of like tiny figurines on the, on the top, <laughs> so at least this way, at least this way people could actually see us a little bit more, but uh, yeah, I would love to hear kind of your, your, your story, for, uh, Frederick. Yeah. And, and I'm going to take this a, a little bit of a different angle because I do believe in true guidance, meaning your financial advisor is a partner with you on this journey, this financial journey in life. Um, and it's about guiding you, not necessarily scripting and telling you every decision and answer you have to make. But, uh, and, and the different route I'm going to go is I was walking today. So usually I'll go out to lunch and take an uh, afternoon walk. And the day in Atlanta, it was like just the absolute perfect day. It was like 72 degrees, it was sunny. And it was a nice gentle breeze. And it was like, why can't I just walk for the rest of the day versus <laughs> the day of work? But, uh, but on, that, on that walk, I kind of had this thought or analogy, if you will, that kind of came to me about roadmaps and financial life maps. And in particular, uh, I'll give the illustration of, so there's a particular beach in Florida that my family and I enjoy going to almost every year that we get there. But it's about a seven hour journey uh, to get down to the beach. Um, and each trip without fail, I will plug into the uh, map, whether it's Waze or Google Maps, something, I'll plug in the destination to get there. And you may say, well, why if you've gone there on several occasions? And the answer is, yeah, I could attempt uh, that journey kind of from prior familiarity or yeah. just from a general sense of direction haphazardly, but I know what's gonna happen because there's a lot of back road turns and, and lanes here. I know I'm gonna miss a turn. I know I'm gonna have to stop and get directions. I know I'm gonna get stressed at that point because things aren't going to plan. And that's gonna stress out my wife who's gonna give me an earful then. And ultimately, <laughs> we're gonna arrive at our destination late and it's gonna cost us beach time and it's gonna cost us family experiences. And so kind of the moral of that story, if you will, I know being haphazard is going to cost me something. And usually it's time, money, stress, and experiences. And so I said, well, what if you parallel that to kind of our financial journey? Most everyone on this Zoom call has lifestyle and retirement related goals that they're all pursuing. And we have questions about you know, how much do I need in assets to retire? How much income am I going to need? Am I going to be able to pay for college education? Are we going to be able to do the things we want to do in retirement? And the questions go on and on, and they're all that very valid, plausible questions that we have to answer. But I pause a moment and say, are there a couple of bigger questions that I would pose we think about? And one is, where is your financial life map, just like that roadmap, to get there? Where's your financial life map to get to your destination? And two, who's guiding you? Because there's a direct correlation between fiduciary responsibilities and if you're a little bit more beholden to having to sell products or other services. Um, and, and I was thinking, you know, we kind of all have doctors that we go to for our physical health. Yep. But do we have a fiduciary certified professional for our financial health? Uh, there's a difference between kind of the self-diagnosis 
and treatment versus that of your own versus that of a seasoned and qualified experienced professional. Uh, now that's not to say, again, that's not to say you, we couldn't get there on our own without right. that life cap, but getting there haphazardly, it costs us something, time, money, stress, and experiences. Oh, I love it. Love it, Frederick. Thanks so much. That's you got goosebumps. A, yeah, that was, I'm glad we're recording this. <laughs> um, what about you, Stacey? Yeah, you know, for me, um, yeah, I uh, think often about, you know, sort of life lessons that I had uh, growing up. My parents, um, you know, didn't have anybody that really helped them uh, navigate their way, but they were always, you know, resourceful and natural problem solvers. And they instilled in me the importance of working hard and, um, you know, finding, finding joy in the simplicities of life. And that is a true path to happiness. And, you know, I knew early on that I needed to work uh, just to make a living. And I was fortunate enough to figure out that I like numbers, I like problem solving. So finance arena seemed to be a right pathway for me. But as I, you know, experienced my own life experiences, I realized, you know, just where there's a deficit when it comes to financial guidance for people in their lives. And it's such an important, critical uh, thing to have um, the right information and the right support. So uh, people who work with me uh, know that my own personal fitness is important. And I often talk about the importance of financial fitness. So uh, working out with my personal trainer, I set goals of things that are important for me to do. And um, in reality, I'm lucky. I like to run. I like to do sit-ups, push-ups. I'm that weird person that, you know, likes to do a burpee. And yet the thing that I found out is that I only do them when I have somebody who's there to help me be accountable and to remind me what my goals are, to remind me why I set out to do these things. And that's the thing that I found is really the most important thing for me to do to my, do with my clients. So I often will talk about people hire me for structure and discipline. They hired me to be an intellectual thought partner and help them be creative in the way that they reach their goals. Um, the reason why I decided to go independent was that oftentimes, you know, people would come to me in the big broker dealer and be apprehensive, you know, particularly when you seeing things in the news about Ponzi schemes or brokers mm -hmm. doing things that were nefarious, you know, people were really nervous and apprehensive. How do I know that you don't have a hidden agenda and it's much easier for me to be independent because, you know, they get to see me now. They get to see me in the comfort of my home and really get to know who I am. So the notion of, you know, working with somebody who's truly committed. I like, um, Andres, that you said, you know, you want to work with someone that's going to put you first, somebody who finds joy in seeing you be successful. So to me, that's why the most dissatisfying thing I can do is make sure that I've helped somebody be successful but it's making sure that I'm transparent, I'm flexible, I can, you know, come up with all different ideas. Um, you know, some of my friends will tell you I'm the most inquisitive person that they know. And yet, you know, I have a natural curiosity for what's going on with my clients. But I find that unless I really know, you know, what is the true motivation behind what they're trying to do, I'm not able to help them. So, you know. Yeah. So I just find joy in being able to do what I do. And then ultimately compensation wise, I don't have a hidden agenda. People pay me for my time. That's all you pay me for. That's great. That's great. And that's so true that, you know, because we often um, get the question around like price and, but this advisor and ultimately it's kind of like for any profession, um, you know, if I'm trying to hire someone to paint my house, and someone tells me it's five grand, the other one says it's six grand, and then someone comes in and tells me I'll do it for 500 bucks. My first question is, why are you doing five? Like, do you know how to paint? You know, like, well, so I think that's something that also for people to remember, it's like, you, you, you know, you pay, you, you pay for what you get, right? And, and if you're paying for someone's time that really could help you, same way, your point about um, personal trainer, um, you know, I, I didn't have a personal trainer when I was younger. And I used to look at people that had a personal trainer and I'm like, what a waste of money, right? Like, I'm just going to go, I go to the gym. I'm disciplined. I don't need anyone's help. And then three kids later and uh, <laughs> three kids yep. later, and I'm like, 
I would not wake up to go work out if it wasn't because the instructor's waiting for me. That's <laughs> right. Morning. So I've definitely changed my opinion on, on, on that one. Uh, Colin, what about you? Yeah, man, I'm going to go off script a little bit. Um, I definitely went RIA for the reasons we're all describing, you know, independence, conflict free. Um, I wanted to be able to use what technology I wanted. I wanted to be able to make YouTube videos that say I F and love Roth IRAs and you know, get excited and get fired up and be who I am. Um, I'm not going to wear a suit. I'm going to have long hair. We're going to have some fun while we do planning and no jerks are allowed. You know, that's really the practice I'm building. And, uh, you know, you can never, like Steve Jobs said, you can never connect the dots looking backwards. But when I took my practice virtual, um, it allowed my fiance to take her dream job and she moved us from Michigan to Los Angeles. And she works for this little company called Google. And we would have never been able to do that if I was still at the brick and mortar going in nine to five every day, doing what I'm told. And it, it just like makes me want to cry how excited and how uh, we're able to, uh, able to have the flexibility to serve clients the way that I want to. Um, and I'm trying to help clients build their dreams. And, you know, how can you do that if you're not building your own? And that's, that's why I went independent, never looking back and uh, just, just too excited. I can't even <laughs> finish. This awesome. here. No, I, I could, I could sense the excitement and actually it made me think of something that we didn't cover which is actually really important, which is, um, you know, just by hearing Colin, you think Colin will ever stop doing what he does, right? Uh, probably not, right? Versus when you work at a larger organization, the, the churn of advisors is much higher, right? And so at times people will want to work with an advisor. And I see a couple of questions around that, which is, hey, but I love my UBS person. Absolutely, right? You want to work with that person. That's who you're working with. Yeah. The issue is that the larger shops, people tend to move around a lot more often. And, you know, that doesn't mean you can't move with them. Often that's actually what ends up happening anyways. But when you're dealing with uh, people that are independent and have basically like the equivalent of like their name on the, you know, on the storefront, okay. uh, this is their destination. <laughs> so you won't have to kind of chase them around from, you know, from shop to shop. Um, as, as much as as uh, as you would at larger organizations, I forgot is that uh, that one is actually a pretty big one. Yeah, uh, that 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 we see. Uh, well, look, just for the sake of time here, and this was great. I mean, I, I had so much fun. I was listening to you guys, and I'm like, oh my god, we got we got some questions here. I want to make sure that we uh, that we uh, try to answer. Um, okay, so I'll start with one that's really kind of comes to the. Uh, the crux of this whole presentation is, you know, how do I know if the advisor I'm hiring is, you know, has less conflict of interest, right? And we, one, we, we actually have written, you know, pieces of like questions, specific questions to ask, but you, uh, you know, I'll start with Frederick. Is there any particular question or way to phrase it? Because as you know, depending how you ask it, you're going to get different, you know, different answers for different advisors. I, I like to say, start with a few things. You have to do a little bit of homework, but look to see if they're a certified financial planner, they're gonna be required to disclose specific things about if they're fee only, uh, if they're fees based, so that you'll know what type of commission structure that they're on, if they're getting it, or if they're just fee only and you're the only person that are paying them. I think when you get into some of the other uh, financial institutions, you, you just have to become really intentional about digging and asking them to be specific about telling you specifically yeah. what they're uh, going to charge you, uh, yeah. because the requirements are a little bit different because we're hit, we're held to a higher fiduciary standard and required to disclose that. So I think it's persistency and digging and just being persistent until you get that answer. Anything else to add, Colin or Stacey? I would add that you know, certainly, you know, asking them candidly, how do you get paid? And, you know, honestly, people would ask me when I'd ask my you know, clients, do you have any questions? They said no. And I said, you should be asking me how I get compensated. You should ask me if I have revenue sharing relationships. What are the sources of income? You know, and to Frederick's point, if they're a CFP, they're bound to tell you the truth. But hopefully, you know, any other professional, if they're even aware how they're getting paid. Yeah, that's, the, that's the key is that often they don't know, right? right. So you have to kind of, uh, for instance, a, a simple one is, 
uh, well, not so simple, but in the sense of like direct, as you say, is, yeah. is there any investment product that you're recommending uh, to your clients uh, pay you any type of fee or commission? Because if you're direct like that, they might be like, oh yeah, well about that. Yes, actually there, there, there is, right? <laughs> So, uh, so that, and, and again, sometimes they might not even know that their company might get compensated. So they might be like, I don't, <laughs> but like their company will, but at least you get closer to, you know, to the, to the source of truth. Uh, Colin, what about you? Broker dealers can be sneaky, man. By the time I left just to open up a simple IRA was like 25 pages and you were signing waivers that basically said that we're not, we're, you know, not even being giving you right advice. Um, you know, or, or that we are conflicted and that you're waiving that or whatever the case. Um, I posted in the chat here two links to the advisorinfo.sec.gov website and then also the brokercheck.finra.org website. Yeah. Um, great resources. I mean, click those things, look up your advisor. You can see if they have disclosures. You can see if they're an RIA or if they're a broker dealer. And if they're a broker dealer, at least you know that, well, maybe there are some conflicts of interest they're probably still a great person, probably still a great advisor, um, but yep. it's good to know. You know yeah, it's, it's by the know. way, on that point, because this is another question and I want to be clear about this because this, let's put it this way. So the question is like, hey, you know, I have a, I have a great relationship at, with my advisor at Wells Fargo, like, you know, uh, in essence, like are all, all of them, right? It's like, look, I have tons of friends at JP Morgan, good people, right? And actually many advisors, that became independent worked for decades at um, at the larger banks. Uh, just because they work at a larger bank doesn't make them a bad person. I worked at a larger bank for a long period of time. What is really important to understand is essentially how is it that you're paying for the service? And by the way, if they explain to you, I get a commission from this and I could get a commission from this, but I, you've been with me for 20 years and you know what I could, like, fine, now you know, and you're okay with it, but now you understand, you know, essentially how, how people are incentivized. So I want to be clear about that. There's a lot of great folks, actually, uh, majority of people in the network at some point, <laughs> because in, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, actually, there was like no independent advisor, right? Like they all worked at the larger banks. So, um, so there's not like bad people or good people. Um, you know, it's, it's all about just getting the transparency around it. So I want to be clear about that. Uh, Cause I could see how someone might think kind of a little defensive of like, my advisor is great. He's at UBS or he's at yeah. and, uh, and that's absolutely true. I mean, as I said, there's a reason they exist. There are good people there that offer great services. It's just really important to try to understand what the differences uh, are there. Um, there's a couple other questions around more specific around, you know, for instance, why are some of the independent broker dealers not in the network? Right. And I think that's a good question, right? So, um, uh, going back to what we were saying earlier about that spectrum from, you know, more conflict to less conflict, independent broker dealers are, have less conflict than if you're a total captive advisor that was kind of salaried or worked at, at a bank. Nonetheless, the broker dealer does have incentives for you to recommend certain products. Um, so we, as Zoe, we didn't feel comfortable enough kind of going to that spectrum, that part of the spectrum. We do have, for instance, advisors that offer uh, term life insurance, for instance, and in certain states, they have to get a license to offer term life insurance in that state. That's as far as we went because we felt that there was nobody else incentivizing them, you know, like no, no company incentivizing them to, to sell it that they work for. So there's a lot of gray area, right? And that's what I was saying, that there's no bad people or, or good people. The key is just to try to understand, um, you know, why do you feel comfortable? And for Zoe, we just didn't quite feel comfortable kind of going to, 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 that, uh, to that level of the left side of that, of that page. But it's a great question. Um, okay, we got like two minutes here. So there's a number of questions that are asking around. Uh, I mean, there's literally five questions here. How do, I, how do I hire someone like Frederick? How do I hire Stacy? <laughs> like, how do I get to meet these folks? Um, a bunch of comments, kudos to you guys about how high energy you are about what you do. So uh, definitely came through. Um, so to put it all those into kind of one slide here, and while I do this, you know, 
I'm going to say this at the end, but just so I don't forget, thank you so much guys for joining us as, as panelists. Like I, I'm like pumped up, even though it's like 8 PM here in the East, uh, in the East coast after, after you guys presented. So um, you definitely kind of re-energize me here for the day of why we do what we do. Cause you guys are, you can just tell how excited you are uh, about what you do. So thank you so much for, you know, Frederick, Stacy, and, and Colin. Um, just to basically tell you guys how to find us, uh, if you go to zoefin.com, uh, you could basically fill out a form and, and, and basically get matched up with advisors like Stacy, like Colin and Frederick. The reason that we find that that's the easiest way is that it depends where you are, your situation, what you're looking for. Uh, you're, we're going to match you up with the advisor that's going to be able to help you most. Having said that, if you reach out and fill out the form and say, no, you guys are wrong. I want, I want Frederick. You know, we could, we could try to make sure that, <laughs> that we put you in front uh, of, of one of these folks as well. Cause I, after speaking, after hearing them speak, I'm like, I, I don't blame you if you want to work with them. <laughs> uh, they're great advisors. So maybe that's a good spot to, uh, to end it. Once again, thanks so much, Frederick, Stacy, uh, Colin. Thank you. Uh, this all will be recorded, guys, for anyone that's still uh, listening. And you're going to get an email with it. Feel free to share it with family members, friends, whoever you think should hear this. <laughs> uh, that is a, a, a great way to spread the word and you know, making sure that you have transparency and have um, a way to empower yourself to make better decisions. So with that, let's end it. Uh, have a great night, everybody. Take care. Thank awesome. you. Thank Good you. night. Bye-bye.